All right, I'd like to welcome everybody um, and thank you once again for registering for this webinar. I think this is going to be very, very interesting. We've had a couple of um, talks in the past, quite a while ago about analytics, but this is, Jerry is the king of analytics. Um, he's the busiest man in curling, as I said earlier, because he's got so much on the go at the moment. And um, he, he there, there's new technology and there's new competitions and everything's building up to the Olympics. So um, Jerry has been with the, well, he's the president of Curling Zone and operations for World Curling Zone. So anything that you see um, online that isn't related to the World Curling Federation or Curling Canada, that's Jerry. He's also the statistician for U.S. curling and for the Grand Slam of curling. So, Jerry, I'm not going to take up any more time because people will want to hear from you. Um, we'd like people to stay muted unless you have a question. If you have a question or a comment or you'd like to relate an experience, we'd like to make this as interactive as we can. So please feel, feel free. If, when you unmute, please um, let us see who's speaking as well. Okay, so Jerry, thank you and take it away. Awesome. And yeah, if, if anybody has questions, feel free to uh, jump into the chat, either put the question in there and, and, and stuff as well. I think that's a, a good way to do it and we can, we can bring them in as we do. Yeah, I'd love to create an interactive uh, option here where we're back and forth and, and, and talking about uh, what you see on here. I'll try and go as slow or as fast as everybody here can handle. It's a lot of numbers and charts. So if you like looking at numbers and charts, uh, it's going to uh, be a fun uh, presentation. At the same time, it's very much about how do we take the numbers and these charts and read in real life analysis to it. And so that's the big piece that I try to do with uh, Curling Zone Analytics. And, and, and it's trying to figure out how to teach people to use this information because a big part of what we're doing, this information that I'm going through here has been the, uh, the sort of the, the crux of Curling Zones Analytics program for the last four to six years or so. And, and it's getting to the point now where a lot of this information is starting to become a lot more public. And now we're looking to do more work in, in making this available uh, on a wider scale. So sessions like this is something I'm very interested in doing more of, doing more teaching. I would like to figure out how to help um, people who are interested in this learn what we do and then utilize this information to go out and, and, and teach their own players and, and, and bring this back to their clubs and so on as well. Because there's some really simple messages in what we're doing with analytics that as we go through, you'll probably start to see it and see some of it come out, that it can even help out club curlers at the end of the day. And so Five Rock has brought a lot of new uh, tactics and new ideas to the sport. And it has created a pretty significant change to how teams play the game. And, and that's something as well that, that uh, we dive into a little bit deeper here. So. Um, I've got a few charts here. Um, I put a few of these together and it's something that I try and start with. But again, I've got a bunch of uh, data from this season from some of the women's teams that are playing. I've been working on writing some reports. So, uh, you know, I figure I might as well pull this up and do a, a deeper dive into it with everyone here. There's certainly some really interesting points in it as to what teams are doing and teams I haven't seen a single game uh, from this season where we can get an idea of how they're already playing the game. So one of the things, uh, when we look at the numbers and the data and the program and everything, this is, when, when you look at the, 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 the stuff put in front of you, it, it, it creates a kind of a, so much information that's information overload. And when we look at analytics and the data, it's a very important component to the sports psychology and the mindset of the athletes at the end of the day. And this is the piece that when we were working with John Schuster's team in the summer ahead of the Olympics, is that they were a team who didn't buy into numbers. They had a hard time with it. They didn't, you know, you know, like many people, they, they were a little slower to adopt to it. 
So when I sat down with their team, we went and looked at uh, very specific markers. We pulled up their records compared to opponents, and we started picking apart uh, the teams that they might be playing at the Olympics. When you looked at Nicholas Adin's team, they were so-so in that up one without, down one with. All of a sudden now you have one of the best teams in the world, and you look at their numbers and you say, I am on. there's a hole in their game in that spot. If we can get to the last end against this team in one of these situations, they're human. Brad Gushu during the 2018 World Championships in Las Vegas was playing against the United States as Rich Ruina. And in the round robin game, we gave Ruinan's team some information on Gushu that they were giving up steals 25% of the time when they were down one with hammer when you looked at all of their game uh data from when they had the hammer total they were giving up steals nine percent of the time so the vast majority of gushu's steals that they were giving up that season were when they were down one with hammer and when we look closer at the numbers we could understand why in that gushu was playing too aggressively in the scenario and when opponents played aggressively against him it essentially would turn into a cement mixer mess in the rings and Gushu would be forced. He'd give up a ton of steals. When you consider 25% of the time for arguably the best team in the world, you know, outside of a Dean at world championships, you know, it, it's, it's something shocking. And so the advice to team ruin in that round Robin game. And then eventually the playoff game was get up one without, and that's when you push all in. That's the spot in the game where Brad Gushu had shown some weakness. And now they had a mission on how to do that. And they went out and did. They won that game in the round robin. Unfortunately for them, come playoff time, they never got the chance to, uh, to get into that situation again. John Schuster had this information again the next uh, fall playing uh, at the Masters Grand Slam event. And uh, just one tidbit ahead of the game. Hey, uh, John, if you get to this situation, here's where their weakness is. I think it was fifth end. Schuster's up one without hammer. He throws a double center guard. This was two, three years ago now, the year after 2019. Double center guards up one without in a scenario that wasn't standard yet for double center guards. And Schuster went on to steal two in that end and, and cruise to a win. So, this, so the idea here, when you start looking at the analytics, you're looking at little pieces. You're trying to find the weakness. You're trying to find a way to break down your opponents to make them not human. Or sorry, to make them human. When you look at some of the teams out there, the Brad Gushus of the world, the Anna Hasselborgs, the, the best of the best, when you step on the ice against a team like that, you really have no idea where to start. And so that's where the numbers are really valuable and the types of things that we, we dive into. So when we start looking at scenarios in the game, um, it's, it's very consistent when you look across uh, uh, the numbers. So you see right here, we're looking at, uh, this, is, this is sort of a corner piece of what we call our, our poker percentages chart, which means that just like poker on TV, they show two hands, they show the percentages that at any given time. This is the win rate in these scenarios. So when you look at, uh, and we go backwards here from last end <laughs> forward. So extra end, one end to go is the 10th or the 8th of a, of a 10 or 8 end game. And then two to go is seven or nine, three to go is six or eight, and so on. So when you look at the numbers here, with seven to go, six to go, five to go, four, three, two, one, you have very much the, uh, the same win rate. You go from 61 to 63 to 65, 63, 65. And so we tend to group these scenarios all into, <clears throat> into a similar bucket. Like I don't, want, I don't want in the minds of the curlers to be saying, okay, with five to go, it's 63. With four to go, it's 65. Because from a, a significance of numbers perspective, those are all the same. They're, they're close enough that to group them to simplify the way you approach the game, that's the best thing to do. So what we end up doing is, is we put uh, these scenarios sort of into buckets. So anytime a team is tied with the hammer, and this is prior to the last end where you see that changes when tied with the hammer, 
and up one without, we call that a control situation. So that means you're about 55 to 68% to win the game, given the ranges that we work with in that realm. And when you're in a control situation, you know, we, we suggest certain types of tactics. Down one with hammer is very much in line with tied without. So you see there, the numbers are fairly similar and they end up in, in, a, in the same bucket. Not quite as good being tied without, but the differences are still pretty small at the end of the day when you consider moving from one to the other. This is the idea that let's say you're down uh, one with the hammer and you've got a risky scenario to try and score two or an easy shot for one. You know, early in the game, you may want to just kick the, the can down the road, take your single point and make sure you maintain where you are in the game versus giving up a, a steal that puts you even further behind. And so that tied with the hammer, up one without, we go to tied without, down one with, we go to down one without, down two with. So I'll, I'll show you what we label these and what they all mean. But it's very much when you score one, in most scenarios, you maintain where you are in the game within a reasonable range. So part of that now, that is step one in identifying what you're trying to do. When you have the hammer in the first end and you score a single point, I've heard from a number of teams that they consider that a failure, that they didn't meet the objective to try and score two. And obviously you want to get more than one. But at the end of the day, scoring one means you maintain your advantage. And when you're up one without, you're still in that 55 to 60% range any time in the game. So that's something to consider when you look at this. And, and the idea that uh, with the hammer, boring curling is winning curling is, is, a, is a motto that we like to uh, promote at the same time too. So again, here we look at a few of these other similar scenarios. This is the up uh, one with hammer to the up two without. You'll see the winning percentages in those two scenarios is very similar. And so, you know, the idea that, you know, let's say you are uh, down uh, two um, with hammer, middle of the game, early in the game, same thing. Scoring one is, is maintaining where you are in the situation. And so now when you start making, when you start going through decision making, this is an important place to start. You know, where does getting one, getting two get us to on the chart? And one of the things that we find really interesting in the game, and it's, it's very much a talking point on TV. I know it's something that is promoted in the coaching circles a lot. But when you look at end control and the idea of blanking ends, uh, blanking the odds and scoring in evens, the numbers on their own don't, don't suggest that it's a good idea. So like when you look at uh, this chart here, for example, the uh, evens are your one to go, which is the eight or the 10th, three to go, which is the six or the eight, and five to go, which is the uh, fourth or the sixth. And you start to see that as you, as you lose ends, your advantage or disadvantage increases, which makes sense because as you have less opportunities to score, when you're ahead, that's good. But when you're behind and you kill an end with a blank, you end up eliminating an opportunity to try and score two and change the game. And so this is the piece where we find it really interesting when teams who are behind are blanking ends to kill to, to try and, and score in the evens and so on. And this would work well if we were playing a brick wall. The idea that when you're playing an opponent, they have just as much opportunity to try and blank the end at the end of the day too. So there's some application when you look at this for teams to blank and control the ends and so on against opponents that are not good at blanking. And when you're ahead at the end of the day, 
you want to blank every end you can because you, you, you start running out the clock on your opponent at the same time too. One of the other challenges that I see out of end control, and when you go back to uh, the 2010 Olympics and, and Cheryl Bernard's team, she was the, the queen of blanking the, odd, blanking the even, sorry, blanking the odds and scoring in the even. And she would start that to the degree where they would be focusing on that strategy in the second, the fourth, the sixth, early in games. And what we were able to do in that against a team like that is that you know exactly what they want to do. And if you're a team that wants to control the ends like that, we can very easily go look it up and see that you're blanking more ends in the, in the odds and so on. And then all of a sudden you start throwing a double center against a team like that when, they, when you know they want to blank and all of a sudden you make them uncomfortable. And so that's an important piece to utilizing the data to understand your opponents, but also to understand that you do not want to become too predictable as a team at the same time too. I know I had this a little bit on the, this chart here. It was the 2018 and this, this probably illustrates the, the odds and the evens a little bit better as a chart where you see there tied with the hammer, you'll see that 61.2, 61.8. 63.2 then when you go to four ends to go it's 65.3 and then it swings back and forth a little bit this shows a slight advantage to blanking the odds and scoring and evens the problem with that though is you're really only looking at a two percent difference in 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 the outcomes and what that means is is that you need to make that blank 100% of the time for that 2% to even matter. And so when you consider nose hitting the blank every once in a while, when you consider the flash on the blank, for, for playing that way and blanking those ends by choice, you lose any upside and you're forced to a single at the end of the day. So it certainly created some interesting scenarios to look at deeper at those numbers too. Um, Jump ahead right here. So again, this is looking a little bit deeper into the, uh, the poker percentages and trying to identify where teams have problems or where teams are strong. And one of the things, this, this data I believe is from three to four years leading into the 2018 Olympics, maybe 2019 as well. And this is some absolutely shocking data out of uh, Team Muirhead. This was when we, when we started looking at this information with two ends to go tied with the hammer, Muirhead was nine and 11. When you see the numbers around her, around that there, when she got the last end, obviously it was 72%. With three ends to go, the eighth of a 10 end game or the sixth of an eight end game, she was up in the 70% range, which is, which is above average. So then when we, when we started drilling deeper into it, we actually looked at the outcomes in those ends to try and get an understanding of why Eve was losing a lot of games in that seventh or ninth end, uh, that second last end of the game. And when we looked a little bit closer, she was giving up a pile of steals. And so the bottom two rows there sort of show the steals out of those 20 outcomes there was uh, 10 steals. Tied with the hammer, 10 ends out of 20, she gave up a steal. So all of a sudden now against a team that's this good, you can sit down in, in, in the uh, ahead of the game and go, okay, if we ever fall behind, you know, we just got to get to that ninth end in a tie game. You got to fight back to that situation. And now that's where you know a team will potentially let you back into the game. And using the eye test and following the games and, and understanding what was going on, when we were watching Eve play those games during that time frame, she was trying way too hard to score two. And if a team played properly against her and was aggressive and really went all in, the ends turned into a giant mess. And for a, a team to make a couple of good shots, all of a sudden you steal and now you flip the game. 
So again, one of the best teams in the world. You can see the chart, the rest of the numbers there, very difficult to, to beat late in games. But there's one hole in that game where you can understand and, and see that. And absolutely, this is the piece where, where data and utilizing it properly is, is truly part of the, the sports psychology mindset piece. You know, the idea that if we can show you where, if we can show you weakness in an opponent and show you a pathway to winning, all of a sudden now that mindset changes in how you approach the team and the confidence that you play. It was one of the things that uh, Team Schuster uh, talked about on a, on a podcast following the uh, Olympics win, where we went through a bunch of their opponents and showed how Team Schuster late in games was one of the best teams in the game and showed their strengths. And following that, when you start, started to see some of the weight come off of John's shoulders, John stopped trying so hard in some of these scenarios. And they're one of the teams now that I see all the time go out there and they'll score an easy two in the first end out of the gate so many times just because they don't try so hard and they just let it come to them. And so it's trusting it, believing it and knowing that you're there. And, and curling is a funny game now. We see it happen so many times where games are lost before the game even starts. You see an opponent step on the ice against the better team and they have no idea how to win the game. And in a scenario like that, the, the, those teams rarely lose. So I'm going to jump into a couple of reports here. Anybody have any questions while we're uh, crossing over and, and moving into the next piece? I just want to clarify, Jerry, um, yeah, the, the, about blanking in. So you did say that a blank may be a missed opportunity to score later in the game, correct? So it's the idea that uh, when you play to blank from the start of the end, mm -hmm. you're not going to score two, right? Right. There's no upside left in the end anymore. You're, you're either going to score one or you're going to get the blank. And so when you give up the upside in that scenario and you know your outcome turns into just you know you get forced then all of a sudden when when blanking itself isn't even the best option so one of the scenarios and i'm going to jump back into that and i'll and i'm going to talk about uh i think the ch i think the numbers are here so there was a game that i that i love to use and look at and talk about uh from uh, the canada cup when Steve Laycock was playing against Brad Gushu. And this was the year that Gushu was out. So it was Mark Nichols skipping the game. And Laycock was down one with the hammer playing the eighth end. So in that, that scenario, that is uh, uh, three ends to go, 63. So, so for Laycock, he was in the down one with scenario. So now you start to look at that and you say, okay, 41.7% to win the game. So now you start thinking about, okay, they, they got down to the end of the end where there was a single rock <clears throat> in play. It was sitting back of the eight foot, bite, sorry, biting the back of the eight foot at about seven o'clock. If you put the rings into a, into a, into a clock. And Laycock kept throwing the corner guard. And you got to a point late in the end where the commentary started to talk about how Laycock was going to force themselves into a single point, meaning that they were going to try too hard to get two when, you know, the blank, when they, they could have just hit the back stone and, and walked away with the blank. This is probably a good illustration of this, Andrea. Okay. You need to pick pieces of this. And then I, it was uh, last of the third stones and uh, Laycock's third threw a, a corner guard that had it been on the center line, it would have been in the ring. So like it was tight. And Gushu or Nichols called the hit and roll in. They hit the guard, rolled into the rings and now they were sitting top eight biting, back eight biting in a line. And same scenario, it's Steve's first shot and the commentary in the end talked about how 
you know, make the double, get the blank. But instead, Steve drew around. And he got around to the back one. Nichols followed down, chipped off the top one. And all of a sudden, Laycock made the hit, scored two, and now had the lead. And I think the reason why this simple scenario is critical to look at is now we go and look at the numbers with two ends to go. So let's say Laycock takes that 41% and he blanks that eighth end. He then moves to the to two ends to go with a 37.3% chance to win. Let's say Laycock got forced to one. He would be down one, or sorry, he'd be tied without 34.4%. Why would you play an end? Those are essentially the same numbers when you consider how close they really are and situational in games when at the end of the day, he would be purposely playing to be in the same scenario, blanking or scoring one. So that at the end, so by losing the upside, you actually take out any chance to win. Whereas now when he flipped the script, he went, he went to that up one without, which is 62.7. So the difference in, in how they played out those last few shots in the end, <clears throat> Steve had the upside in that game. And I actually talked to Laycock afterwards, and he absolutely knew those numbers. Steve's one of the smartest skips I, I've met out there, really knows the game well and understands a lot of this information. And, and that decision in itself, when you know you're talking about a, a difference in three percent, the risk that you're taking, you know, for the opportunity to to now essentially gain thirty, what is that twenty five percent or so in advantage by playing for two, meaning that if if Laycock got forced to one there, it actually didn't really matter. So that's sort of the idea of of playing for the upside, you know, where the blank. Uh, is, is less relevant. Whereas, you know, you still get the same thing going backwards. It's that eighth to the ninth end where this sort of scenario is more critical. Like it's the one point in the game where you see that in that eighth end, that if you score one, now both teams have one hammer left, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of on a more even ground, which is why you're down one with hammer scenario loses some value and that's the worst time to be down in a game down one in the game is with two to go so you see where that drops off then you know it's mm -hmm. in the it's almost it's pretty much in the 40s every other end and then drops down to 37 percent with two to go so it creates some interesting scenarios and decision making around that eighth end like tied with the hammer you should absolutely not be giving up a steal scoring one is fine Scoring a cheap deuce is exactly what you want to do. So you want to minimize risk in that scenario and make sure you don't give up a steal because up one without, that's where you want to, that's where you'd rather be than down. One. We have a question. Yes. Um, as a junior coach, what stats analytics should um, the coach be focused on with his own or her own players uh, beyond the standard points for against, steals for against? What, what should a coach be looking for? So a lot of what we try and do is build team statistics. So like the idea <laughs> that how you're working as a team, what the numbers look like as a group. And I think when, when we look at the numbers and the consistency here, this chart is, is a good piece for this. The idea that scoring one, anytime you have the hammer, you maintain your advantage. And if you take the flip side to that, you look here at, uh, you know, let's take any one of these ends. HMR means tied with the hammer. STL is any end where you're, you don't have hammer. We tried to separate that and make that easier to, to identify. But let's say you're playing uh, the, the fourth end and you give up a steal. All of a sudden now you go from a, we'll call it 60% advantage to a 40% advantage when we round it and simplify it in the minds of the players. Again, I don't want to be talking to the players about 61.8 or 63.2. I want to round the numbers to simple concepts. 
But let's say you give up a steal and now you go from, from to 40%. All of a sudden, we could probably even 65, 35 in, in this level of game. The, what you lose in that scenario is massive and, and, and the difference that you make. And, when you, and, and this applies to all levels. So it's that idea that you want to maintain that advantage when you're tied with the hammer or up one without. You want to make sure that you don't do things that give up those steals and change the game. And, and so for junior curlers, especially, you know, the steals are what are what uh, kill teams. If you can eliminate steals, the best teams in the world do not give up steals, which makes sense because as you get down to, to making the game closer and closer into a chess game where execution is, uh, is almost uh, perfect, making that last shot's always going to be made then too. And so that's critical to, to success of teams at the end of the day. And so now when you back up the way you play the game, how do we not give up steals? Our number one objective as a team should be to not give up steals. And that's the piece as we dig into our next generation of information. I'll give you some tidbits on here, but I, won't, I don't want to give away any of the, all the secrets. But the general idea and the simple way to look at this is that if you have the hammer, you want to keep the middle open. And so our advice is your lead stones are played in a way to achieve your objective of not giving up steals. So where you throw them needs to be part of that strategy. Things like drawing to the wing, things like drawing not fully buried around center guards is also something that we consider a critical way to do this. And then when your opponents start to throw up guards, you then use your second stones to continue that mantra. We want to not give up steals this scent. Peel something in the middle. Wreck something in the middle. If you're going to play a hit on something, let's say there's a buried stone around a guard, use tactics that give you benefit even when you half shot miss. So one of the things that we talk about is the, is the soft weight shots. And Andrea, your, uh, your work with Team Flurry, this is probably something that uh, a point that I love to dig into every once in a while. The Canada Cup uh, 2019, and again, this comes from the commentary uh, following the games where Flurry's team was the number one team in the round robin going into the playoffs, I believe. They were the highest scoring team in the field. Yet when they looked at the shooting percentages data of the players in front of Tracy, the narrative became... Tracy's a one-man band and she's been standing on her head all week. When you start to dig a little deeper into that, though, Tracy's team loves to play the soft shots. Mm -hmm. And it's the tweener shots that you want to learn to play. That hack weight, that board weight, so that when you wreck the guard, because wrecking the guard on a guarded stone is still a good shot. But if you can ever roll that shooter into the rings on the wing, all of a sudden now you've created a pressure rock for your opponent. And there's two ways to pressure your opponent. One is to close the scoring area down. And the other is to make them draw against a bunch. You know, you sit in the hack and all of a sudden you, you push somebody out of their mindset. The idea that I can hit the forefoot anytime I want. If you ever get the other skip sitting in the hack going sh shoot there's four in the rings i better hit it this time all of a sudden you just flip a little switch and you can change the mindset of your opponent and make them feel a little bit uncomfortable and when you can make your opponents uncomfortable they don't play at, at the best they can be and so the same mindset there then comes into how you play the ends out so you know the idea then second stones you want to keep the middle open there's a buried stone underneath there's a center guard. We see so many teams want to draw in and, and, and uh, build the pile. And instead, what I love seeing teams do, and Brendan Botcher's team is the king of this as well. We talked about this on Sportsnet during some broadcasts a few years ago where Botcher was just obscene uh, with the hand. And the reason for it is that when Botcher got into those early shots, the second stones into third stones, they tended to play a lot of hit and rolls. They tended to play a lot of digs and roll the shooter out into the open, where if you 
are tight and you wreck the guard, your shooter goes into the rings. And now all of a sudden they can't guard shot stone. They might have to hit the open one. And now all of a sudden you're playing the end open. Like the whole idea around tick shots is something that I think the WCF's move to remove it is going to be a requirement for the game because somebody is going to perfect this. The whole idea that not giving up steals, if you make the tick shots all the time, you're never going to give up steals. And the piece of this that becomes extra interesting from some of the work that we're doing is that when you draw behind the T-line, around the center guard, Kevin Martin refers to it as the Donnie B3 for Don Bartlett back in the day, is that the, that stone is not in the way. And if you throw your tick shots to the point where the miss is back 12, you don't actually miss with some of the data we've started mm -hmm. to collect. In that going back 12 with the hammer team early rock is very much the same as burying it top four, top eight, top 12. And so now if you're playing the tick shot with back 12 and you always throw the right weight, you can't miss. And so those concepts kind of sort of flow out into some of the things as well, where <clears throat> the mindset is to do not give up steals, the types of shots that we want to play, keep hitting the middle, soft shots where we get a result out of a miss still. And by the time you get to third stones, first of the third stones, second of the third stones, let's say you play double peels the whole end. You tried to make the double peel, move the, the rocks off the middle. You miss a couple, you get like you get one and you, you don't get the other one. They got to throw it up again. You miss it. They got to throw it up again. The things that end up happening is that at some point you make one of them or they don't throw it as well. And it's an easier shot. And by the time you get to the end of the end, the middle is open and there's a bunch of shrapnel up along the edges. Corner guards that you can go score a cheap deuce with. And so this is the, the idea that boring curling is winning curling with the hammer. In that keep that middle open, don't give up steals and your cheap twos will, will fall in your lap if you can do that. Does that make sense? All right, so I've got some reports here that I pulled out on a few teams. So this is uh, Team Hasselborg from uh, the 2019-20 season, one year, the last uh, pre-pandemic season that we ended up playing. And you can start to go through the data on the teams. You start to look at uh, with Hammer in the first end, and you identify a way a team plays. So in this scenario here, um, actually, I should be able to highlight that. So right up here. So I look at this one. This is a, a, a big piece of data that I like to look at. How does a team play that first end? And in this scenario here, 34% of the time they were blanking that first end. Um, a little bit on the high end. I think uh, women's curling is around 25%. But at one point, Rachel Holman's team was blanking that first end in the 65% range. So now all of a sudden you step on the ice against a team like that, you're, like, you're, you're going to have an understanding of the way they're going to want to play that first end. If they've got a high number of blank ends, a low number of steals given up, which is what we see here with Hasselberg, five and two, we're, gonna, we're going to then look at it and say, okay, they're not getting super aggressive in the first end. They're not putting a ton of rocks in play, so we, we approach it accordingly. When you look at then Hasselborg without the hammer and, and you start to look at it and you say, okay, this profile tells me that their opponent is blanking the first end almost 50% of the time, 47.6. Hasselborg was stealing in the first end. They only stole once, 5% of the time. So now if I'm a team and I want to get comfortable in the game, I would expect that Hasselberg's probably going to go in. They're not going to put up a whole lot of resistance in that first end, and they're going to give me a chance to get comfortable. Now, when I jump into a different team, let's say a team with zero blanks in the first end. Now, all of a sudden, I'm going to know just from looking at the data that I'm probably going to face a center guard, and I might face two. 
and I'm going to face an aggressive attack the entire end where they come at. So now the approach I need to take is very different in those two scenarios. There was one profile I know when we were looking at it, it was Anna Sidorova's team. This was leading into the 2018 Olympics. And they had a high percentage of blanks and a high percentage of being forced to a single in the first end. And it was very confusing because that makes no sense. Because if you're not blanking, you're not, you shouldn't be getting forced. Sorry, if you are blanking, you shouldn't be getting forced very often because that's your decision. And after some discussion around the table with Team Hasselborg about this, we came to the conclusion that they were nose hitting the blank a lot. And when we started to think back through the games and the experiences that they had, that was in fact the case. So now when you play uh, Sidorova's team or a team with a profile like that at that time, go in, they might get the force for you on their own. So against a team like that, don't try anything too hard. Tom Brewster's team going back to 2012, this was a profile where uh, <clears throat> his Scottish team loved the blank the first end. But they were so-so when they blanked that first end. If they ever scored two in the first end, though, they were nearly unbeatable. So <clears throat> when, when you played that team in the first end, you kind of were like, you know what, I'm going to let him do what he wants because that's not their optimal outcome in that first end. And if I take too much risk, I might push them into a situation where they do get a chance to take two. So again, some of these decisions go into looking deeper into these things. So the piece, uh, the piece I, I like to look at here a lot more, and especially early in the season, is this uh, change analysis piece at the bottom. And I'll sort of explain what we're looking at here um, as uh, just to educate the concept here, because this is the piece where I look at and, and try and understand how a team plays in these scenarios. That 25% number I talked about, Team Gushu, and where they were struggling down one with Hammer, that would have been this scenario right here, where for Hasselborg, it was 32%. So looking at Hasselberg's 2019-20 data, the only place they struggled in their game was when they got behind with the hammer because, because they gave up so many steals. And, and that's the piece where you start to identify you know, how you play and when you play aggressively with or without the hammer. So when, when we look at these numbers here, we broke it down into, into sort of English language uh, uh, labels. So remember I talked about control. That's the scenario where you're 55 to 68% to win, up one without hammer, or tied with the hammer. So you see here, as I scroll across, you'll see that they played 133 ends where they were in control. Of those ends, 90 were with hammer. And you see there where score means it's a tied game. BL is blank ends. So that means 28% of the time the end was blanked. Hammer efficiency was at 58%. The hammer efficiency three or more was 9%. And the SD is steel defense. The percentage of steals be being given up was 17%. When you scroll across to the without hammer section there, again, 43%, sorry, 43 of those ends, 43 plus 90 equals 133, were played up one without. 12% of those ends were blanked. The force efficiency, which is holding your opponent to a single <laughs> point when they score. Force efficiency, holding a team to two or less when they, when they score. And then of course, SE is steel efficiency. So when you start to look at some of these numbers, the idea that blanking ends when you have hammer shows that you're playing a more conservative open approach. That, that tends to be the result of those ends. And when you play a more conservative approach with the hammer, you tend to give up less steals. One of the things that we've, 
come to find when we put this data together is that when you give up less steals, you end up increasing the number of twos you score at the same time. Because if you don't make for a giant mess and you keep it open, it's that simplifying, keep the middle open, keep the middle open. And by the time you get to the end of the end, you're going to score a lot more simple deuces. And so, Andrea, I know you introduced me as USA Curling and, uh, and Grand Slam stats. I know some of that's evolved and we're, we're moving uh, away from that stuff and going more independent on this. I'm going to show, I'm going to pull up uh, uh, Tabitha Peterson's report from so far this season. And theirs is an extreme example of, of what I'm talking about here. Let's see if I can, you see that one right here? So Peterson, is that the chart you got showing? Yes, it's Tabitha's. Perfect. So I'm oh. gonna scroll right down to the bottom. So you can see as much as you can down there, that change analysis piece. If you look at the without hammer ends for team Peterson, zero blanks when their opponent has hammer this season. Wow. When you look at the steel efficiency numbers, 50%, 37%, 42%, 40%, 22%, 22%. It's the idea that a strong, aggressive attack to steel is actually the same outcome, or is, is, is the same approach you should take to force. And it, and it was Eddie Lukowicz who actually, I, I picked this up. He was coaching with the US program and it was one of the things that he was really big into was that when you didn't have the hammer, that you should be attacking your opponents and putting pressure on. And now with the five rock rule, it's actually a requirement because if you don't attack and put enough pressure on your opponents, they'll score a deuce even if you make all your shots. And I think that was the problem that we saw at the world championships for both Botcher and Anerson in that when they got the leads and they went to more of a defensive approach and tried to, you know, hit their way out of trouble and, and, and play a little bit more of a conservative game plan, opponents now who are starting to do this and become more aggressive were able to cut them apart. when. You know, the idea that being aggressive and continue to put pressure on your opponents, like Team Peterson doesn't even let their opponents blank when they're at any time. And, and so now the pressure that they put on to their opponents forces a lot of times where you see there, again, we're not talking about a ton of data here, 19 ends tied, 12 ends up one, 10 ends up two. But when I start to see like single out, like when I start to look at this, 10 ends is where I start to draw some conclusions as to how a team is playing. And at this point, the number of blank ends that we're talking about here, none over the course of all these ends is, is very significant. Because when you then flip over and look at their, their play with Hammer, they are blanking a lot more ends. And so it's not like they are are consciously unable to blank ends where you saw that out of, uh, especially early on, you saw that out of a lot of teams playing out of Asia. They just played aggressive all the time and you never really saw blank ends. So, so the way Tabitha Peterson plays the game is, is they're hyper aggressive without the hammer and they're, they're fairly conservative without it. And when you look at their numbers down one with the hammer, they're scoring two or more 78% of the time. Only nine ends. We haven't seen any blanks in that scenario, but I'm certain they're playing a more conservative approach. Tied, they're blanking 20% of the time. Up one, they're blanking 25% of the time. Even when they're behind, they're playing to blank and playing a more open conservative approach and generating strong hammer numbers at the same time. And, and so you can start to identify some really extreme numbers here. When we looked back at uh, Unjung Kim and the 2018 Olympics, the, the gold medal game uh, for Hasselborg 
they were coming up against an opponent like Peterson that was hyper aggressive without him. And so in order to nullify that, they played hyper conservative against that uh, when they had the hand. Hit everything in the middle. If there's a rock in the middle, you hit it, you roll to a corner if you, if you want to. Never draw around that single center guard because when you draw around, for sure the Korean team was going to draw around. So if you ever miss, you're definitely looking at a cut down four, uh, four foot to throw your last. And you never really needed to do more than that because if you hit and roll to a corner, the Koreans really didn't have a, a, a way to approach that. And they would go around the corner. And if, if you got a miss out of them, you score two. And even if you missed everything for the rest of the end around the corner, you probably got the four foot to draw. So you're still going to score your one and make sure you get out of trouble and kick the can down the road. Um, we have a question. What does the color coding mean in the team chart? Okay, perfect. That's a good question and, and probably helpful. So when, <clears throat> so when I look at these numbers here, I, I break down a few different pieces in, in this. So let's look at, uh, I'll pick the one end to go, this, this row here. So for Hasselborg in that situation, 100% was her team's win rate in that scenario. A 1-0 and record. Not much significance in the data there, but that's, that's sort of what that means. And then the 28.9% is if you go onto curling zone and you click on the analytics charts and you look at the, the charts over the time frame, that is the percentage above or below the average. So in that scenario, the average would have been 71.1%. And for Hasselborg, 100% minus 71.1 gets you 28.9. So it gives you an idea of how much better they are than the average and how to approach a team. That's the piece when we start looking at these charts, the, the poker percentages piece here. here is that uh, one of the scenarios I, I like to dig into again, uh, uh, Cheryl Bernard, when we talked about her end control, the way they played the game and the reason why it wasn't wrong for Cheryl to do this at the time is that tied with the hammer in the last end, meaning that if she just, you know, continued to, to keep the hammer and keep control of the game down to the end, she was 24 and one going into the Olympics for the four years leading up to that. She won in the last end. If she had hammer in the last end in a tie game, she won. There's very few skips I would pick to throw the last rock for me and Cheryl Bernard would be high on that list. In the extra end, and unfortunate for Cheryl, she was 24 and 0 going into the Olympics. And that last end of the last game where she had the hammer for gold, it was just sort of one of those unfortunate flukes where, you know, the pressure of the moment would get into anybody. And so I, I really hate the idea that, you know, when you hear about people talking about a team choking in the moment, that that is absolutely not who Cheryl Bernard was. And, mm -hmm. and it was just the moment in the game because you're going to lose some of those games. And unfortunately that one happened to be on the biggest stage in the, in the biggest event. And so that's where anecdotal evidence can sometimes fool you too. Because playing Cheryl the next year, you'd be like, well, I saw a glorious failure in that moment. Well, let's put her in that again, because maybe that happens. But that's just one data point out of a, a host of many to look at. And so, so when we look at these charts, we can kind of use that. Like is a team above the average in the scenario? And you might get into a situation where that player then is a, a clutch player. So, sorry, Andrea, you were going to ask something. I, I, yeah, so going back to the colors. Yeah, yes. So the, it's color coded. Right. So, so the orange is, let me see if I have the legend here somewhere, not on here. So orange is 15% or more above the average. So the, the above the average number is the 29.8, the 28.9%. The 19.1% as you go down the hammer tied row there. So anything that's orange is what I would call elite. 
anything that is what's our next color there the green no yellow yellow is five to 15 percent above the average so all of a sudden so this is the thing when we pull these charts out when we started color coding them we then you know you can identify that this is a, an elite team in general very quickly mm -hmm. because of where the orange color coding is the, the little bit of yellow that's scattered in the green is five is plus or minus five percent so that's right around the average. Uh, blue is five to 15% below, and then purple is 15% uh, or more below the average. And you do see a few purples in this spot here. Some of this data is not really of value. And you, you need to start collecting enough ends for this stuff to matter. So like, for example, you look at Hasselborg and the extra end, 4-0 with the hammer, 0-1 without. Can't really read a whole lot out of that because that's, that's sort of the expected outcomes anyways. But like I said, you remember that Eve Muirhead scenario where we were looking at? That would have been this end right here. And that was the one that did not jive with, with an orange team. That one would have been showing as purple. And all of a sudden now that jumps out to, as something to, to look more closely at. Very cool. Uh, let me see if I've got a couple more quick ones here. I don't want to hold anybody up too much longer. Yeah, Jennifer Jones's team. This was an interesting one too. <clears throat> In the two to three years leading up to the, like, let's, let's say 18, 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20 seasons, you saw Jennifer's team change the way they played a little bit and they got more conservative without the hammer. And when you go back and, and think about why Jennifer was so good over those years is that she put relentless pressure on her opponents. One of the things that's happened in, in the women's game, especially, and I think in the last 10 years, the, the skill level has massively grown and evolved. Like, I don't think when you, when you look at Jennifer, when you look at Rachel, when you look at the top Canadian teams that have sort of spanned that time frame, they haven't gotten worse. It's not like they're, they're not as good anymore. It's that the rest of the world is caught up and the game now becomes more about making the last shot as it is putting pressure on your opponent to make them miss. And so one of the things you saw at a Jennifer is that I think they got to the point where that putting their pressure on their opponents was not doing the same thing for them anymore at the elite level of the game. And so they changed their, their strategy a little bit to not get so aggressive without and try and be a little bit more aggressive with hammer. And I think that's been some of Jennifer's struggles a lot, those, those years, because they lost that advantage and that, that power and that aggression. If you go back and look at the way they're playing now, though, their blank ends are way down again. So when you look at without hammer, 5% of the time they've, blank, they've allowed the blank uh, in a tie game and 7% when they're up. And you start to look at the steel numbers that come out of a, a situation like that. And, and, and you start to understand where adding that pressure and, and the results that this turns out to. The big piece of this and the thing that numbers can do now is that you can take an approach, a finite approach to how you play the game and then read data out of it. I remember doing this myself one year where we played a tournament and my strategy was to be hyper aggressive with and without the hammer. And I went back and I looked at the data. We were awesome without the hammer. We stole a ton of ends and it was why we were successful in the event. We were terrible with the hammer. So I was like, okay, well, let's keep the piece that works, the without, and let's be more, you know, let's try something different with Hammer. And we went and played an event, and we didn't give up a single steal in the round robin by being pretty conservative with Hammer, but continuing to be hyper-aggressive without. And I think some of that now is, is when you look at the Five Rock game, that's even more important now. And we, we hear the discussion around 
the the men's game right now where teams are blank are are going two down on purpose instead of being tied without and the piece to that scenario is that as the game becomes more like chess which is the tied uh with scenario your your chances of winning is going to go down like the tick shot is made so often at the at the absolute elite part of the game that the skip at that level is not going to miss the four foot and most of the time they just need to hit the eight foot for the win if you make two good ticks and so now going down two with hammer is where you'd rather be and now when you start to step back it's the teams who don't play aggressive enough who actually get sliced and diced up by team cooey bruce moet lost twice in the 2006 18 19 season up to without against Cooey. And Moet tried to defend his way to the win. Whereas if you flip that around and say, my, the optimal way to force my opponent to a single point or to make it hard on them to score multiple points is to be aggressive, that means you should be throwing double center guards when you're up to without against Kevin Cooey. It sounds insane, yeah. but you're starting to see that if as as the approach because it's not about and, and it's flipping the mindset a little bit. It's not about <clears throat> trying to steal. Those center guards are giving you the opportunity to control the center real estate. And if you don't control the center real estate, the team with hammer is just going to run wild and you're going to be facing a, a skip stones where you have no chance to steal and any kind of a miss means you might give up three or more and so in that scenario again you lose the upside so so that's that's sort of some of the things that we've really started to see and, and, and some conclusions out of the way teams are playing and how they're playing and the double center guard is king and, and the data that comes out of that and and the ability for teams to do that if you're the team without hammer, you should absolutely be playing that and trying that and if you're with hammer. You got to be figuring out ways to avoid and, and stay out of that trouble. Um, we have a question. Um, is it against the CCA or curling Canada or WCF or world curling zone rules for the players to have data like this on them during a game, i.e. printed on paper in their pocket? No, no, absolutely not. No, I didn't think so either. Yeah, it's yeah. the kind of thing where uh, Team Peterson was working on a on a playbook. The last I uh, was working with him, the idea that you took the numbers and you built out uh, a, a general playbook as to how you wanted to approach things. Like the the thing with the numbers is, and and this is a critical way to use these things because the worst thing you can do is put too much information in front of a player. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's paralysis by analysis. You want to keep it as simple as possible for the teams. So for somebody like me who loves looking at numbers and I want to understand and know the situation, I want the numbers and the chart in front of me. But when you're looking at and, and working with your teams, the best approach is to simplify things as much as possible. And that's where what we try to do with the change analysis chart is exactly what we do there. We group all the ends into a, into a collection. And in this scenario, this is all ends in the game. So like first, so, so, you know, all ends where they're down one with hammer, all ends where they're down two with hammer and so on. It's, it's, it's good in itself as a, a general understanding, but then we start looking at early ends and late ends. Had a team that played great in the early ends with Hammer, but then as the game went on, they started to struggle in the second half. And now when you start looking at that, the idea is, is well, your opponent doesn't play you the same way in that scenario. So when you're tied with the hammer in the early ends, your opponent's not going to try as hard against you. They're going to be a little bit more conservative. They don't want to get into trouble. And you're going to have a little bit more freedom as the hammer team to, to play. But as the later ends go, they're going to be more aggressive. You're going to get into trouble. You need to adapt your approach to what your opponent's expected approach is going to be. 
And we are able to identify that very quickly just looking at the numbers in that spot. Uh, Bill, Bill Shearhart used to always tell the story about working with a team out of Manitoba. And he asked them what their strategic philosophy was, what their game plan was. And you know this story, Jerry, and they would say- I don't say, think I've heard this one actually. Oh, the, their, their game plan was to um, be very offensive to start and build up a big lead and then hit <laughs> until the opposition caught up. <laughs> yeah, and that you could do that in the four rocking. Yes. Yeah, but you can't anymore. You can't anymore. Like it got no. to the point where, so one of the one of the scenarios came up. Uh, Kevin Martin's team, that that hero team uh, with Johnny Moe and Mark and and Benny, they were playing in the uh, the World Championships. It was the page one two game against David Murdoch. This was the year before Moncton, so this was the one where they went on to to win. And. Martin was up four, up four points at the break. And when, uh, when it was said and done, Murdoch won the page one, two game. <laughs> and when I looked at Martin's numbers, I went back a decade before and I could not <clears throat> find a single game where Kevin was up to or more at the break that he lost. Like that's how good teams at that level are when they get a simple two-point lead yeah yeah and and the way it's played out and it hasn't changed that much anymore when these teams get a lead they Going keep making you. shots and they and they get out of trouble and there's there's a few other pieces to that like when you look at a team like jacobs for example they're the poster team for never like like i've heard a rule change suggested the idea that if you blank an end you should lose the hammer if you told Team Jacobs that they could peel their way out to force their opponent to have to take one, I'm pretty certain Jacobs would be able to accomplish that uh, fairly consistently. Easy peasy, right? Yeah. 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 So, so all of a sudden, you would then end up with, with Jacobs just running all the time when they didn't have hammer anytime they had any advantage tie game, or sorry, up one without, up two without, just run everything. So it, it, it's sort of some of these things dive into that too. Yeah. Should we open up the mics, Jerry, and see if there's any... For sure. I'd love to, to hear some questions and, and get into some conversations. And I can dive into some numbers a little bit here too. I've probably got half an hour or so. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can unmute and uh, ask, talk to Jerry. Um, do, uh, do, can people just email you to get access to the analytics site on curling zone? So there's, uh, there's some basic analytics up there right now. One of the things I want to start doing, and I've had some conversations about, uh, people who want to learn this to facilitate courses and stuff. And so I want to start offering this as courses back to teams and coaches and things like that. And we're in the process of sort of building that out. Um, it's, it's the piece that like our next generation of analytics, we start to look at the way teams play ends out versus the general end uh, theory stuff that we get here. But understanding this stuff then helps teams be better at the next generation stuff. And, at this point, like you look at Jennifer Jones's profile right here, she's, they're already doing this and I'm not working with them. Like this, this knowledge is out there now. This is, this stuff isn't a secret anymore. And so now it's a matter of spreading this out and, and making sure more teams have access to this and, so, and teams beyond just the elite. So it will be, it will be available. Yeah, we're working on it. That's, okay. that's the big chunk to this. The, yeah. There is some baseline analytics on curling zone right now. If you're curious and interested in learning more, you can always, the best place to, to, to get a hold of me and have these conversations is probably on Facebook Messenger. I get buried in emails. I'm sure there's people on here who have not gotten responses on emails, but my email inbox is a lost cause at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and Messenger works. I learned that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So best I, to get a hold of. Yeah. I, I have a question then, Jerry. Oh, wait, sure. 
um, if what's the difference then between um, a force, a team viewing, taking one point, yep. getting one point as a force and viewing it as um, maintaining the advantage? So it's like, it, it's sort of maintaining your current situation. Okay. So like the, the chance of winning the game does, doesn't uh, change. The, the way I used that was sort of the idea for the first end. And so just starting the game with hammer, you're the favorite to win somewhere in the 55 to 60% range. Again, as the skill level improves, that number actually goes up. Mm -hmm. So in slams, for example, that advantage is even better. And so by scoring one, you then stay in a control situation you're still in that 55 to 60% chance of winning the game. So in that scenario, you are maintaining your advantage by forcing a single. So it's just the way I was using the language on it. Whereas let's say the team without hammer in that first end and they get a force, they, they hold their opponent to a single, that team stays at very much that same 30, I'll do the backwards math, 35 to 40% chance of winning the game does that make sense yeah yeah, yeah. okay that makes sense you stay in the same place essentially like anytime a single point is put up on the board before the last end your chance of winning the game stays fairly similar mm -hmm. oh i i worked with a with a team with team Mada for several years and they turned that one point into a positive Yes. So they never viewed it as a force. It was always, we're in the game. We're in Absolutely. the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, and that's, that's the crazy thing about it. Like in that situation, you might lose one or 2% because mm -hmm. having the hammer in a tie game is slightly better because there's a better chance of scoring two than stealing usually slightly better. And so you're going to be better off tied, tied with the hammer, but you're talking like, I'll take two numbers. It might be 57% tied with the hammer to 55% up one without. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at numbers and the difference, that's the same thing. That's the same. And that's number. why we put them into boxes to make it a lot easier for most people to apply. Yeah. Okay. I have another question. Um, someone wants to know if they send you their team's analytics, would you analyze them and give feedback on what you see? So if your games are on curling zone, I can pull that data up without looking at it. We'd have to punch this stuff into, uh, into uh, the system in order to pull out the different pieces. Um, but we could, yeah, we could definitely do some different things with teams. And I do some one-off consulting with teams and there's a few teams I'm working with this year to try and put some stuff together. It's been a, we've been working on other stuff and analytics has actually kind of taken a backseat a little bit in our development because there's a lot of grunt work behind the scenes to make this go. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about concepts and move things forward and, and, and do that. And, and the, way we, the way we structured this financially in the past is we took a percentage of winnings. So when we're talking about regional tour teams who might win a, a little bit here and a little bit there, the cost of this then ended up being scaled to what they ended up actually playing for. And so I'm, I, I, I love to be able to help out teams who are interested in this and, and, and see the, the growth that comes out of it too. When you see teams that, you know, when you look at their numbers, they, they may look like a lost cause, but when they start to nail down some of these things, all of a sudden the change can, can come pretty quickly. So message me on Facebook is the best place to, to get me on this for sure. Okay. Any other questions Jerry? or, oh, here we go. Yeah, okay. I have a question. Um, Jerry, do you, do you think there's a magic point like in uh, let's say team percentage, if you will, as to when the analytics be, really become relevant or do you think that they can be good for, for almost all teams? I mean, obviously if you're only making 30% of your shots that analytics probably are not the biggest problem you have. Um, but there's a point there where you think I work with a junior boys team who are coming along and playing pretty well. And I'm yeah. just trying to figure out my mind when this really becomes important because we're, you know, we're not making every last shot and things like that. So. 
I think it's as important to how you approach the game at the elite level as it could be at the, at the club and even junior levels. And, and it's, and it's just the way you think about it. It's like, you're only using the numbers as a tool at the same time. The concept of keep things simple when you have the hammer, you know, try and, you know, identify where, where these things are happening and, and apply it accordingly. Like very, we, we see very few differences in the numbers, uh, like the poker percentages stuff. I'm going to jump back to, uh, uh, let me see here. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. One second. So when I pull this chart out, for example, this is uh, men's game scenarios, uh, three seasons, uh, and you can see the chunk there. These numbers are not that different from men's to women's to regional tour, even juniors when we started looking at this stuff, even mixed doubles. And we all think mixed doubles is this reckless, crazy game. But here's your numbers for mixed doubles. And you see that again, you go down the HMR, the hammer row tide, and you see very much that same 60, 40 percentage range. When you, when you move over to the one point scenarios there, you've got up one with hammer, DN steel is down one uh, without. And then the next chart is your, this is sort of your classic uh, curling battle scenario. You're up one without versus down one with. This is actually closer to your tied scenario than actually being tied. And even in mixed doubles, you're still very much looking at like a 55 to 60% uh, chance of winning the game when you are up one without. I know from dabbling a little bit in mixed doubles this season, it's sure as heck doesn't feel like it's that sort of feel that way still so that when you look at this this is a game where you have a lower percentage of execution there's a few areas that go up and they're understandable situations that tied with the hammer in the last end the better skilled the competition the more likely you are to maintain your advantage because you're going to make that last shot more often so when you start to look at uh, your junior boys team, for example, you wouldn't necessarily look at the, uh, the men's uh, numbers on their own, but you might go look at uh, a grouping of events where the shooting percentages is a little bit lower. So the, the concepts are still the same, whether it's, it's juniors to elite game, it's the idea that <clears throat> scoring one is always a good thing. It's that, Main, you know, maintaining that spot in your game, knowing when you are ahead and knowing when to take risks. And it, it, it doesn't change that much, to be honest. Okay. Any other questions or comments, experiences? Give people a few seconds to unmute or to enter in the chat. All right, well, I'm not seeing anything. So Jerry, I think we'll wrap it up unless you have something else that you'd yeah, like to. Yeah, that sounds good. It's, uh, yeah, it's always great to, to pull this up and, and talk about this information. I'm always interested in talking with people who, who want to dig deeper into this and learn more and evolve the, the content and everything too. Um, stay on me if you are interested in this because there's a million things moving at the same time with what I'm trying to do. And, uh, and sometimes things fall by the wayside and I don't want to miss things. But yeah, I absolutely love talking to people who, who, who see the game this way too and, and uh, it's fun to evolve it and, and do things this way. My background comes from baseball. 
I'm an absolute uh, oh. analytics junkie when it comes to that. I read Moneyball. The Moneyball, year yeah. it probably came out. I had that book, and uh, and uh, it's it was really cool to go through that and get an understanding for that. And and it's been amazing and a lot of fun to try and apply that mentality and mindset to curling too, because our sport is very much a turn based uh, game. That's there's so many decisions to be made. Um, and I, I'm really appreciative of you taking time, Jerry. I, I, you said earlier in the in the webinar that you're moving into, you're happy to move it, kind of move into the instruction end of it, and you're very good at it. So we really appreciate you sharing your experiences. Um, we have a, just a couple of last comments here. Thanks, Jerry. It's been good. I'm really interested to watch how we can use analytics on a wider and wider scale on different levels of the sport. And I think you said it earlier too, Jerry, that curling all of a sudden, you know, through, has come out of COVID with a renewed focus and there's more competitions and there's more interest. And um, so this is, um, this is great information as, as teams move forward in their development. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh... There's so much power in the data and the types of things we learn from the game. Mm -hmm. The rule changes that the WCF are talking about come very much out of a lot of this data too. Like the tick shot has to be eliminated from the game because it, we see it right now in the last end with, you know, the extra mm -hmm. end tied, the last end tied is actually pretty anticlimactic for the most part. Yeah. You make two ticks, the game, the game is over. For, the, yeah. for most fans watching it, you know, they're still in it. It's a tie game. There's drama, but they don't miss at that level on that last shot anymore. And the team's records show that. My concern, though, is when we get to the point where teams get so good at that tick shot that they make it all the time. And now every end turns into that. And somebody might win the Olympic gold this year, ticking the way, ticking their way to it. I, I really think that that is the easiest way to to do so like when rachel played that way it was a uh, she was dominant mm -hmm. and and that team rarely got into trouble and i'm i'm actually kind of surprised why they got away from it because with with the way they played the game at the time and and how it just made the game so much simpler for them but i also know that it's terrible tv and it's not necessarily a, a, a strategy we would want to suggest that is good for the entertainment component too. Scott McDonald's team was another team that did that a few years ago, and they essentially ticked their way to the briar that year where Scott Chadwick <laughs> was, was automatic. Yep. And even at the provincials, they, uh, they dominated Epping, they dominated Howard right through the playoffs just by ticking it and keeping the middle open and never getting into trouble. So yeah. That I, I think that's a rule change that for the for the sake of the cur for the sake of curling has to has to go and and or has to at least be made more difficult, right? You know the idea that ticking it and moving it off the floor, out of the where it is right now is just makes it too easy. So right, yeah, you see a lot more bump ticks perhaps or yeah angle yeah. bumps, yeah. yeah yeah absolutely. So yeah, it's important. You know our our <laughs> game is. Uh, the skill level of where the athletes are from, you know, you go back through the, through the generations of the game and, and the things that have had to change. These are pure athletes like any other sport. Now. And that's why rule changes happen too. And the data definitely goes into drilling deeper into that too. And you don't want to have to make a correction when the horse is already out of the barn and the game has been, has struggled for some time. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you see it before, before it, it gets there. And that's one of them where the data really strongly shows that. So, yeah, anyways, thanks a lot, Andrea. I love it. Oh, love thank you, Jerry. It. it was worth, well worth <laughs> pursuing you. So I felt like a stalker for a little while, but, but thank you very, very much. So this is being recorded and the recording will be shared. It's taking a bit of time to, to get it uploaded, et cetera, but it will be shared and as with all of these recordings they're for your personal use or your use with your team they're not for um, sharing in a wider public venue so thank you very much everybody thank you jerry um, it's been a it's been a good webinar thank you very much thank you that was Take great care. andrea jerry
Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.